I was very keen on the European Union enlargement and played a major role in it in the early years because I believed that neighbors should cooperate with each other. And so I really like the OSCE framework. I think it's right, and I think it is proper for Europe to have a European security arrangement. All over the world, the regions are divided internally. Typically, Cold War divisions, often on a strategy, imperial U.S. strategy of uh, impera et divide. So we want division. The U.S. is stoking divisions in Northeast Asia. China, Japan is on our side. I'm sorry, uh, Japan and Korea are on our side. Uh, China's on the other side. We're forging a new, uh, a new military alliance, uh, AUKUS, as you know, which is Australia, US, UK for nuclear submarines in uh, Australia. Just what we need. Just what Australia needs. Uh, what the solution is, each region should cooperate. And African Union should cooperate internally. Europe should, of course, aim to include Russia. Of course, are you kidding? How could it not be other than to fall under the nuclear threat day by day again? So all of this cancel culture is mind boggling in how wrong head it is. By the way, even the New York Philharmonic canceled a Rachmaninoff concert for May. You can't even imagine how, I mean, I could never imagine how crude this is. This is high culture. They can't figure out to play Rachmaninoff and that that's okay. Or there were protests about Tchaikovsky, about don't play Sleeping Beauty at Christmas time. Even here, it was an issue. Please. What is more beautiful than Tchaikovsky's Sleeping Beauty? Maybe a few Strauss waltzes also. Okay, I would say that they're right up there. But we should not be behaving this way. And the demonization makes nobody safe. It solves no problems. It puts everybody on a hair trigger. And we are in a nuclear age. And so... This is my basic idea is UN charter and regional cooperation and globally agreed goals, sustainable development goals, Paris Climate Agreement, UN Convention on the Law of the Seas, the High Seas Treaty, the Kunming Montreal Biodiversity Framework. In other words, let's actually take care of people and the planet, instead of the $2.2 trillion spent last year on military armaments, if we could get a bit of that to get kids in school, we'd make a much better world for the hundreds of millions of children who are not in school because their governments are too broke to be able to afford high schools for them. So this is what we should be doing. We actually have globally agreed goals. We have the OSCE. We have the means to do this. U.S. politicians should not fly to Taiwan and declare that we're going to defend Taiwan at all costs. We had agreed 50 years ago to a one China, one China policy, and that's the right policy. And China believes in that because starting in 1839, the Western imperialist powers, followed by Japan, tried to destroy China on several occasions or to conquer China. So 
They're not too keen on that happening again. I understand that. We should have some prudence. So we're not so far away from a peaceful world because the vast majority of people in the world want it. And we don't really have, China, by the way, is not aiming to take over the world. That's another long evening. I have gone to China for 42 years, many times a year on many cases. It's the last thing in the world that I'm worried about is China taking over the world. It's not even a, a category. In 2,000 years of Chinese statecraft, China has not launched one overseas war. 2,000 years. The one that you could count is when the Mongols controlled Beijing and launched a, an invasion of Japan in, I think, 1274, though I may have the date wrong, and the kamikaze winds, a typhoon, defeated the Mongol fleet. Other than that, never. You know, Britain and France fought with each other almost every year for a thousand years one way or another, but Japan and China never, except Japan invading China on three occasions, not, never China invading Japan. So don't worry so much about China. Really don't. Nice place, good food, fascinating culture. Go have a visit. All right. So be before, before, before I ask you the last, the very last question, I just want to add to, uh, to your observation. There was China, Taiwan, in the last uh, survey of the European Council of Foreign Relations, which is a transatlantic uh, think tank. Uh, there was a poll asking citizens, not government, citizens of the European Union, uh, if it comes to a conflict between the US and China over Taiwan, 65% of the Europeans would say, 60 to 65% would say, they rather would stay neutral instead of siding with China or even siding with the US. So European citizens might think differently uh, than their governments. But I cannot <coughs> avoid asking this very last question now because you're sitting here as an American and you uh, also wrote a piece about the link between war and debt. And uh, debt is accumulating uh, in uh, the US and uh, in the US there will be elections uh, next uh, year. So will the debt crisis have an impact on the decision to support, support uh, Ukraine uh, by the next government? Or... Um, US, US politics is basically uh, a plutocratic state uh, where public policy has been taken over by uh, several powerful lobbies, each one devoted to its specific area. And they keep the control over US policy through campaign contributions because our election campaigns are uh, funded by billionaires and by corporate lobbies. And they cost about $15 billion now for an election cycle. And you may have seen George Soros yesterday said, uh, I give my empire to my son. And the son said, I'm going to fund the Democratic Party. <clears throat> well, that's the billionaires that he'll put in hundreds of millions of dollars, a billion dollars would not be surprising uh, in the 2024 election. And then there are other billionaires. And so what are the lobbies? Wall Street controls financial policy and our health lobby controls uh, our unbelievably expensive private so-called health system and our ag lobby controls the food industry with about 60% obesity or, or overweight in the United States. Another huge, ser very serious public health crisis. And the military industrial complex controls foreign policy. 
not just military policy, foreign policy. So we have perpetual war and trillion dollar military budgets, 900 billion in the Pentagon budget, but there's a lot more. There's the CIA and there's Homeland Security and there are many other categories, Department of Energy with nuclear weapons and so on. It's maybe $1.2 trillion a year. So that's on the spending side. On the revenue side, we have unanimous agreement among the billionaires. Don't tax us. It's very simple. So we have a low tax collection in the United States and uh, this spending on the uh, military, for example, which has cost about $6 trillion in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and some of the other wars. Six trillion, it's a lot, by the way. (laughs) Starts to add up a little bit. And so our debt crisis comes from a broken political system. It's not so interesting, Democrats and Republicans, by the way. That's a little bit a children's game. The oligarchy is, the plutocracy is both parties. And I, I lost interest in the because it's basically a game that is below our intelligence. Uh, and this is our problem. Now, we will have rising debt in the future. It's a big country, big economy. We can spend a lot on wars. What There's been no public debate for a moment on the $120 billion that has been spent so far. This has all been just bits and pieces inside omnibus legislation. So we can't get a debate on anything because there is no debate. There'll, there'll have to be another appropriation for Ukraine. They'll try to put it in a must-pass bill so that it's not really debated and can just be snuck in because there's no interest in asking the American people anything about any of this. There's no attempt at deliberative democracy at all. No debate at all. So the answer to the question is I'm not sure because there probably has to be another vote, but they will try to make the vote so that nobody notices Uh, And it's just part of some omnibus legislation that funds Social Security something or other. It's not, won't be Social Security, but it'll be something that has to pass and it'll just get through. That's how it's done in general. If it came to an actual vote, it would probably be defeated. Uh, if, If there was actually a debate in Congress do we really want to spend another 50 or $100 billion on this? It would probably lose. They know that, but they have the convenience of avoiding any kind of public debate. All right. Uh, thank you so much. So we have some more time to exploit your knowledge. Dr. Sachs, uh, we in Canada are deeply grateful to you for having the courage uh, to speak out like you are. I'm from Canada. I'm here in Vienna to attend the International Summit for Peace in Ukraine that was organized by a number of important international peace groups. While I'm here in Vienna for the peace conference, my prime minister and deputy minister are in Kyiv announcing another $500 million package for weapons to Ukraine to prolong this tragic war. I, I am wondering what your suggestions and solutions are to end this war and to bring about peace. Thank you. Second to my own. Yeah. Uh, okay. Whenever, please. Uh, yes. Um, I was surprised when you said you thought if there was a package of money that it would actually not pass, given that every Democrat has gone for as much money as the uh, White House is asking for. And so I wonder if you think that that is changing because public opinion is is actually changing. Uh, And then I I wonder if you could also tell us about your weekend at the Vatican. Mm -hmm. So how am I doing 
Thank you very much. Uh, oh. Microphone. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Sachs, for your excellent uh, explanation. Um, actually, you are confirming what we think. Actually, in, in in that in that sense, I have two small questions. One is coming back to Professor Hans Gertner's um, remark on Minsk uh, Agreement Two and and the idea of neutrality. I mean, I'm sure there are a lot of papers within the. Um, various institute think tanks, et cetera, United States and, and European countries. My question is, what was the main or where, what were the main reasons that they were brought against the neutrality of, of, of Ukraine? Because I think this is a major point, because if the, the country would have accepted a neutrality, we would not have this, this disastrous uh, war and, and, you know, suffering, uh, one, you know, over uh, 100,000 people, innocent people and civilians. The second question is, uh, coming back to your, to your economic background, um, I always wonder, because uh, looking the last economic development of the United States after the Second World War and two, I think probably you will agree with me that there are a lot of poverty, there are more slums, there are more uh, people who are begging on the street. My question is, why the people are not coming to the street and asking for their rights, for, for basic rights, not human rights? You know, I mean, of course, um, economic rights are human rights, but my question is, why the people have not come yet to, to the street and asking more for their rights? Thanks. Uh, we had a more general statement on peace, then the question on whether the package would pass or not, and the Vatican, I don't know whether you want to say something. Yeah, and then uh, the question of neutrality and uh, pro a protest for basic rights. So that would be. First, uh, let me say how disappointed I am in Prime Minister Trudeau, uh, and uh, he should know better. Uh, and act better. By the way, he's very disappointed in me, too. Uh, I pointed out some of the limitations of the United States in a meeting, and he was furious with me. Uh, so uh, I will reciprocate the frustration. Uh, he should know better, but uh, he has signed on, let's say, to the US agenda. And uh, I always considered Canada the sane part of North America. Uh, that's a little unfair to Mexico, because Mexico's technically also North America. But of the two countries, uh, I'm a Detroiter originally, so I always viewed Canada as my southern neighbor, because we drove south from Detroit to get to Windsor. Uh, but uh, uh, let me just say, I always admired Canada as being kinder, gentler, more rational, um, and I'm still hoping for something better uh, because Canada really can do better. And Canadian society, thank God, doesn't have the disasters the United States society has because uh, it is a kinder, gentler country. Uh, but the policies are... Uh, you know, there's a large uh, Ukrainian emigre community. It's a powerful voting group. But the big misunderstanding is sending NATO to Ukraine is no friend to Ukraine. It's the biggest disaster. I mean, all of this war is the biggest disaster possible. That's what I tried to explain to my Ukrainian friends for years. Don't get into the middle of a proxy war of the United States. It destroys you. And that's what's happening to Ukraine. So I'm not against Ukraine. I'm trying to save Ukraine, not the way that the United States does it. The United States, quote, claim to want to save Afghanistan. Well, there you have proof positive of what it means when the United States wants to save you. Please don't try that at home. Uh, it's uh, really not a good idea. Um, 
what I meant specifically about the vote, yes, if there's a vote, it'll pass if there's no public debate, but if there is a real public debate, and so this has procedures that it goes through both, uh, it goes through committees in the House. There are witnesses. You testify. I testify. We bring uh, people to Washington. We have an expression of the will of the American people. There's a good chance. And even uh, I'm waiting for Rand Paul and others to uh, just get 40 votes in the uh, U.S. Senate, which would stop this as well. So I think that if this were ever democratized, uh, we would actually have a, a real chance. The American people do not want this war. This is absolutely clear. Uh, and uh, I think that, um, but they don't give us the chance for that kind of public debate. The US is against neutrality because NATO is US power. That's the basic idea. That is the neocon idea. They call it liberal hegemony. Uh, it's a ridiculous idea. Um, but that has been the idea since 1992. And um, it's deep. As I explained, it's bipartisan. It's basically owned by the military industrial complex. Um, <clears throat> Victoria Newland is probably the single best illustration of the deep state aspect of this because in the early uh, 1990s, uh, or actually in the, sorry, in the early 2000s, she was Cheney's security advisor. That's not a good start, by the way. <laughs> Uh, the man who brought us multiple disasters. Then she became, under Bush Jr., the U.S. ambassador to NATO during 2005 to 2008. So she was a key point person in the commitment of NATO to enlarge. Then she became Hillary Clinton's spokesperson. Hmm. You see, Democrat, Republican, it doesn't matter. Then she became Assistant Secretary of State for European Affairs. And she was the person who coordinated the US on the Maidan. And she's the one on the phone call, the fuck Europe uh, phone call, excuse, excuse her language, it's not my language. Uh, she's the one on that phone call. Then, She's now Under Secretary of State. So this is both parties. This is continuity. This is a strategy. Why does NATO propose to open an office in Japan now? Really? Is NATO the US expeditionary force for the upcoming Taiwan war? What could they conceivably be thinking? Why did the U.S. insist on inviting four Asia-Pacific leaders to NATO? Because they have no sense. Because they are looking towards a global war. So why they do this, I think it is what... William Fulbright, 60 years ago, called, t entitled, a great book which people should read, The Arrogance of Power. They are drunk with power. And that's what this is about. And they don't know better. They're out of control. So I have several questions on let me just uh, a quick just, just, uh, sorry 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 for that yeah just to so the, say uh the protests on the, on the streets so yeah so basic rights yeah so the vatican uh the vatican. unfortunately <laughs> uh, um was a little outside the vatican because pope had uh, surgery last weekend it turned out in the end um and thank goodness he's recovering very well uh but we had an event uh at the auditorium 
Ara Pacis, which is uh, the altar of peace under Augustus, uh, just next to the uh, Augustus uh, mausoleum, uh, just across the Tiber from the Vatican. And it was the 60th anniversary of John F. Kennedy's peace speech. And that is a speech I would recommend that everybody listen to again and again. I've made my family listen to it I don't know how many times. But it's uh, the greatest speech by an American leader in modern history. And he gave it 60 years ago, June 10, 1963. And we celebrated that by bringing together um, Carrie Kennedy, President Kennedy's niece, uh, and uh, Robert Kennedy's daughter, and Nina Khrushchev, the granddaughter of Nikita Khrushchev, and Gillian Sorensen, the widow of Theodore Sorensen, who wrote the speech together with President Kennedy. So it was a wonderful occasion. And that speech was a speech at the height of the Cold War, telling the American people, we can negotiate peace with the Soviet Union. It was extraordinarily brave, extraordinarily beautiful, extraordinarily wise, and it led <coughs> to the Partial Nuclear Test Ban Treaty five, year, five weeks after President Kennedy gave the speech. And the speech is filled with wisdom that we should take into account. One of the parts of the speech that uh, we should take into account, and let me read you uh, just this excerpt to get it exactly right, because it is... Uh, extremely important for our survival. Uh, if I can find it. 